and the chapter is 23. Psalm, the chapter is 23. Reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, there you will find these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It is from that passage of Scripture that I would like to preach from the subject, which is in, which is in the form of a question. And that question is, is the Lord your shepherd? Is the Lord your shepherd? Psalm 23 is one of the most popular chapters in the Bible. This psalm is known as the shepherd's psalm. It is a psalm that we know is written by King David, who himself was an experienced shepherd. It is a psalm of comfort. For if the Lord is our shepherd, then by the end of this psalm, we know everything will be all right. It is a psalm of worship, for it magnifies the name of the shepherd, who is the Lord, and speaks to his strength and speaks to his compassion. It is a teaching psalm, for everything we need to know about the role of the shepherd is summarized in these six verses, which strengthens our understanding of God's rebuke to pastors in the Old Testament, Jesus identifying himself as the good shepherd in the New Testament, and the role of an elder in a congregation of God's people today. Now, we don't know exactly when this psalm was written. We can speculate, but we have no idea when it was written. But maybe David wrote and sung this psalm to King Saul, after the king became distressed due to the spirit of the Lord leaving him because of the king's disobedience. Maybe David whispered these words prior to his battle with Goliath after, after he used his experience as a shepherd to qualify himself to fight this particular giant. Or maybe David penned this psalm when he was running from King Saul because Saul wanted him dead and the words of this psalm refrained him from killing the king when the opportunity presented itself for he knew that God would one day vindicate him in due time. Or could it be that David scribed these words in haste as he led a mass exodus from his kingdom when his own son Absalom rose to power. Well, whenever this psalm was written, we know that it is still relevant today. It is as relevant, it is as powerful, it is as encouraging, it is as comforting, and it is as educational today as it was the time it was written. We still know that this particular psalm is God's word. God allowed this king to be inspired to pen these words, and these words have been written to us and for us to understand who it is that we are serving. And also we need to understand that this psalm, even though it's in the Old Testament, even though it was written by a king named David, it is worthy of our attention on today. Now, there's four points I want to bring to your attention, and the lesson is yours to respond to. And all of these points are questions. Number one, we're going to talk about what is a shepherd. 
Then number two, we're going to talk about who is the shepherd. Number three, we're going to go back to the title of the message and ask the question, is the Lord your shepherd? And then we're going to talk about, even after all the information that is given, what are we supposed to learn from these six verses to apply in the 21st century? So first, let's start with the question, what is a shepherd? Well, a shepherd is a person who herds and guards and leads and feeds and tends sheep. The duties of a shepherd in an unenclosed unenclosed country like Palestine were very onerous. That means that it was a burdensome work. It was a troublesome work. It can even at times be an oppressive work or a work that causes hardship. In other words, to be a shepherd at this time was not an easy task. In the early morning, the shepherd would lead forth the flock from the fold, marching to the front to the spot where they were to pasture. It is at this point the shepherd would watch the sheep all day long, taking care that none of the sheep go astray. Now, if at any time, uh, for a time, uh, any of these sheep eluded his watch, if you will, and wandered away from the rest of the flock, this shepherd would go out of his way and he would seek that sheep diligently until he found the sheep and brought that sheep back. In Palestine, sheep required a regular supply of water. And it was the responsibility of the shepherd to guide them either to some light running stream or to wells dug in the wilderness and furnish the sheep with troughs. At night, the shepherd brought the flock home to the fold, counting them as they passed under the rod at the door to assure himself that none were missing. The shepherd's job did not end at sunset. Often he had to guard the fold through the dark hours from the attack of wild beasts such as wolves or the wildly attempts of a prowling thief. This was the work of a shepherd. So when God says that he is our shepherd, understand that this is God speaking about what he does for us even to this day. But who is the shepherd? I've sort of given you the answer already, but if you weren't paying attention, then just stop the tape, rewind, and press play because the Lord is our shepherd. And that Lord is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ identifies himself, even in the New Testament, as being the good shepherd. We see that in John chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. The Christian takes comfort in the assurance that the Son of God is the shepherd. Now, at the time this text was written, there was no such thing as a Christian. So the Israelite, the child of God under the covenant, would have read this same text and identified God the Father as the shepherd. Now, I want us to understand on this morning that to say that Jesus is the shepherd or to say that God the Father, Jehovah, is the shepherd is not a contradiction of ideas because the same psalmist who says that the Lord is my shepherd identifies both Jehovah and Jesus as Lord. Listen to your Bible. In Psalm 110, and the verse is one, we see a messianic psalm where the Bible reads in Psalm 110 in the verses 1, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Both Jehovah and Jesus serve as Lord. As a matter of fact, when we understand the order of things, it is Jehovah, God the Father. He is the one who has the authority to give authority, and it is he who made Jesus, our Lord and Savior, both Lord and Christ over and in our lives. As it was explained in the first sermon preached 
on the first Pentecost after the resurrection of Jesus in Acts chapter 2, verse 36. And so if we truly understand who our shepherd is and our shepherd being Jesus Christ, then we know what his responsibilities are, what his job is, what he has commissioned himself to do on our behalf. He will herd us. He will guard us. He will lead us. He will feed us. He will tend to us as children of God. The Bible makes clear that we are the sheep of his pasture. Listen to your Bible in Psalm 100 and the verses 3. Psalm 100 and the verses 3. The Bible reads, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So as sheep, the Lord willingly laid down his life for us because he is the shepherd. He cares for us. And so the question has to be asked now, is the Lord your shepherd? We know that the Lord is the shepherd, but can we make it personal and say, yep, he is my shepherd. Is he your shepherd? Is he our shepherd? Now, in order for the Lord to be our shepherd, we have to be one of his sheep. And what is a sheep? Well, when we look at the physical makeup of a sheep and the mentality and the physiology of a sheep, then we understand that sheep are dumb animals. In other words, they're a can short of a six-pack. Uh, when we're talking about sheep, we're talking about at times an a sheep may get in an elevator and his elevator skips a floor or, or that his driveway doesn't go all the way to the street. Uh, sheep are missing something, and therefore he needs a shepherd. Not only are sheep dumb animals, but sheep are timid animals. Sheep are weak animals. Sheep are submissive animals. Sheep are easily swayed and led. And God says, not only are we the sheep of his pasture, but he wants us to be the sheep of his pasture. God wants to be our shepherd. And as sheep, we recognize our need for not a bad shepherd, not a hireling, but we have a need for the good shepherd. Because if we are dumb animals, then we recognize the fact that we have no direction. Therefore, we have to look to God for that direction. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23. If we are timid animals, that means that we are fearful. Therefore, we look to God for power, love, and a sound mind, according to 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. If we are weak animals, then we recognize that we have no strength outside of God. Therefore, we look to Christ for strength, according to Philippians chapter 4, and the verse is 13. We are supposed to be submissive, and so we are submissive. Therefore, we have no problem obeying the Lord over man, according to Acts chapter 5, verse 29. And we are easily swayed and led. Therefore, we should have no problem following Jesus Christ, who does not sin and only has our best interests at heart, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. And so as we take a look at these six verses in Psalm 23, we come up with some points because arguments are made that if we say the Lord is our shepherd, then there are some things that ought to be taking place in our lives. If we look at Psalm chapter 23, verse 1 and 2, we recognize that if the Lord is our shepherd, then there is nothing that we want because in Christ we have all that we need. Again, there is nothing that we want because if the Lord is our shepherd, we in Christ, we have everything that we need. When he makes us lie down in green pastures, then the Lord has provided our food and rest. When, we, when he leads us beside the still waters, then the Lord has provided that which is necessary to quench our thirst. 
still waters are waters that are available for drinking. So to restore something, because he restores our soul, to restore something means to bring it back into existence or use, to reestablish. So the Lord is actually in the business of reestablishing our soul. We need to recognize that an established soul is a saved soul. An established soul is a purified soul. Food, water, rest, and restoration are necessities only the Lord can provide for each and every one of us. That brings us to verse 3. In Psalm 23 and the verses 3, if the Lord is our shepherd, then we should never doubt his direction. If the Lord is our shepherd, we should never doubt his direction. Another thing we need to recognize about sheep is that sheep have poor vision, for they can only look down. So how does the shepherd lead them? Well, the sheep follows the voice and the steps of the shepherd. If we are truly sheep of the great shepherd of our souls, then we must be totally dependent upon God's word and Christ's example. We see that in John chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, as well as 1 Peter chapter 2 and the verses 21. The Lord will lead us into the paths of righteousness, For his name's sake, that means his reputation is on the line. And by way of his leadership and reputation, we learn to do the right thing, the right way, for the right reasons. We may not understand the landscape. We may not appreciate the scenery. We may not like the road that we are traveling, but regardless of what we think, regardless of what we believe, and regardless of what we feel, the way of the Lord will never lead us astray. Which brings us to Psalm 23 in the verses 4. In Psalm 23 in the verses 4, that verse makes clear to us that if the Lord is our shepherd, then he will never leave us when we need him the most. He will never leave us when we need him the most. There are times in which we will be in the valley of the shadow of death. A shadow, by definition, is an indication of the substance to come. Our goal is to not stay in the valley, but rather to walk through the valley. Since the Lord is our shepherd, then we should never fear evil while in the valley. Now, my question is why? It is because fear shows a lack of faith in the shepherd, and it nullifies the love we ought to have for the shepherd. And we see Jesus making a similar comment in Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, and we hear the words of the apostle John saying that perfect love casts out fear in 1 John chapter 4, in the verses 18. We must take comfort in the rod and the staff of the Lord. The Lord's rod and staff is a sign of his authority over us, but also his authority over the devil and his authority over the world in which we live. The same rod that the Lord uses to correct us and keep us is also used to fight off the enemy. The staff of the Lord is an aid that is used in walking. And as Christians, let us take comfort in the authority and the love and the strength and the ability of the Lord to forever stand and never to fall. That brings us now to Psalm 23 and the verses 5. In Psalm 23 and the verses 5, that verse should teach us that if the Lord is our shepherd, he will vindicate us. If the Lord is truly our shepherd, then he will vindicate us. Now, according to the psalmist, nobody can clear us from an accusation or suspicion like the Lord. 
The Lord's vindication, according to this text, is threefold. Number one, he will do it in the presence of our accuser. That means that if you have some haters in your life, but the Lord is your shepherd, then the Lord will actually elevate you in the presence of all those who have ever talked about you and slandered you and accused you and said things falsely against you and have maligned you and have tried to hurt you. This is the Lord's way of doing things. But number two, he will elevate us to a higher position than where we began. David started as a shepherd of sheep, but he ended up as a shepherd of people. He went from being the least in his father's house to being the greatest in the kingdom of Israel. This is how God does things. And then number three, his blessings will be more abundant than they were previously. See, God will fix it so that all those who have ever talked bad about us or tried diligently to bring us down and discourage us will be present when God blesses us. The Lord will favor us over all because we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a peculiar people. For this reason, we should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness and has brought us into his marvelous light, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Lord will see to it that our cup that once was empty has become so full that it runs out and causes us to drink from the saucer. In the words of the prophet Micah, Micah says in Micah chapter 7, verse 8, Rejoice not over me, O my enemy. When I fall, I shall rise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. And that now brings us to Psalm 23 in the verses 6. If the Lord is our shepherd, then his protection is inevitable. If the Lord is our shepherd, then his protection over us is inevitable. When we fall back, God has compassion, and he will be good to us in order to lead us back to repentance. Listen to your Bible. In Romans chapter 2 and the verses 4, Romans chapter 2 and the verses 4, the Bible reads, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. The Lord is good to us by protecting us from all directions. Christ in front, rod on one side of us, staff on the other side of us, goodness and mercy in the back. This goodness and mercy keeps the sheep in the fold, restores the sheep who have wandered from the fold, and makes room for sheep who desire to be in this fold. And so, now since we know what a shepherd is, who the shepherd is, and now we can answer the question for ourselves, is the Lord our shepherd understanding the benefits of his love over us? What are we to learn from Psalm 23? There's three brief points, and then the lesson is yours to respond to. Number one, we must choose today who will solely shepherd our souls. We can't walk in this world without somebody leading us and guiding us. The question is, who do we choose to do that? Will it be the Lord? Will it be man? Will it be money? Or will it be self? But we will be led. I recommend that we choose Jesus because he is the good shepherd. Number two, our security is not in the safety of the situation, but in the subsistence of the shepherd. 
Let me say that again. Our security is not in the safety of the situation, but in the subsistence of the shepherd. The pasture, still waters, paths, house, and fold only provides protection for us because of the presence of the shepherd. Take away the shepherd or stray from the shepherd and such places provide no safety from the enemy. Nevertheless, if we find ourselves in the valley, then if we have a relationship with the lily of the valley, then the security of our souls would not be breached by the shadows, threats of death and evil. And then the third point that we should learn from this text is that we can only have as many folds as we have shepherds. There is only one shepherd. Therefore, there can only be one fold. And so the question on this afternoon is, are you in the fold of God? Where do you stand on this afternoon? Yeah, we talked about sheep and we talked about shepherds on today. We talked about fields. We talked about pastures. We talked about still waters. But have you taken a drink? And are you drinking from the fountain of living water, who is Jesus Christ himself? Because if we drink from him, we will never thirst again. Why don't you drink? from Jesus. There's a song that we often sing that there's a fountain free. It costs you nothing. All you have to do is say, not my will, but your will, God, I will do. I will follow you. I will obey you because you have the words of eternal life. You are the only one that has a heaven or a hell to put me in. I cannot survive in this world unless you are leading me through this life. You know, there are a lot of people that recognize their need for a shepherd. And when they recognize their need for a shepherd and they recognize that Jesus is the obvious choice, then they give up sin, according to Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Will you do that on this afternoon? Will you be like the Ethiopian treasurer? who said, how can I understand the words of God unless some man should guide me? Even this man recognizes his need for God. And in Acts chapter 8, verse 37, he says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus is by far the most qualified guide in life because he's the only one that's been to heaven, came down to earth, and went back to heaven, and not once did he lose his way. So if anybody knows the way to glory, it's Jesus Christ. So therefore, we need to hear him. We need to listen to him. And will you come to the still waters of baptism? You don't have to drink this water. All you have to do is be immersed in it, make contact with the blood of Jesus Christ. And as a result of this water, let God do his shearing of you at that time by washing away your sins, according to Acts chapter 22, verse 16. But maybe you are a Christian. Maybe you have already obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe that portion of the invitation doesn't apply to you because you've already done those things. But have you forgotten who your shepherd is? Have you been trying to follow two shepherds at one time? Have you lost your way? Have you wandered from the fold? Are you in a desert land? Not physically, because physically we are in a desert land. But are you metaphorically, figuratively, spiritually in a desert land where there are no green pastures, where there are no still waters? Hear Jesus call. Listen to his voice. Come to the shepherd and let him count you into the fold once again, just confess your faults, repent of your sins, and pray that the glorious, forgiving, gracious, 
merciful God will forgive you. And he will if you just come on home. Wherever you are this afternoon, make a wise-hearted decision. Why together we stand and sing the song.